Episode 207 of the Hob Nation USA podcast, and we're live on location once again because we have to make up a lot of time for last year. <laughs> yes, we do. This is our 2021 Spicy Boy Summer Revenge Tour. That's right. And so we're on tour. And as you already heard, my co-host Adam is here. Oh, of course. he. Uh, Steve gave me a ride, so I, I figured I'd show up. Yeah, and I'm Steve. And... This week's location is Mondays down in Washington County, and we're joined by head brewer owner Sam. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on. I, it's been too long. We've been planning this one for quite some time. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, we're still new. We've only been doing this for seven months, so... And, yeah, and you've been on on our list for about five months. <laughs> All right, <laughs> the, no, the number of people that have told us we have to go down to Mondays, you have to come down to Mondays, including you guys here at Mondays, have also told us come down to Mondays. <laughs> but now we're finally here. We've made it. We've done it. Yes, That's we good. we have crossed the county line. We have made it. We're happy to be here. I crossed two. You, you, you did actually. Oh, I crossed two. <laughs> well, this is also the entirety of our marketing plan, which is spread by word of mouth. So, like, that's the whole plan. The most consistent way of marketing. Yes. I, I work in online marketing, <laughs> and I still will tell you it's word of mouth that's better. <laughs> it is. <laughs> because word of mouth stands behind the product. Because right. people have already had the product, and they will say, go get it. And guess what? We got told to go get it. So uh-huh. now we're here. That's awesome. Because it comes from people you trust, not the fucking internet. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Put that on a t-shirt. Right. <laughs> Word of mouth. It comes from people you trust, not the fucking internet. That's right. <laughs> yes, because I, I, and I know one of our, our special guest hosts, Kelsey, yeah. she was one of the, the first ones to say, hey, oh, you, know, yeah. you, guys need, you need to get down here. And we know her taste. She's got good taste in beer. And so, she was super upset she couldn't make it tonight. I know. Because she lives kind of right up the road. Yeah. yeah. She, oh, she's a neighbor. So but she she's had, missing out on free beer. That's yeah. right. Well, she had to, she had to travel, so. Well, whomp, whomp. That whole work thing? Yeah. yeah. The whole jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that whole having to pay the mortgage. Yeah. I yes, understand how that goes. But, uh, yes, we're down here at Mondays, and we're joined by Sam. And so, Sam, why don't you start us off by introducing the first beer we're drinking tonight? Oh, sure. Happy to. This beer is called Tangled Aggression, and um, the name comes from an effort to try to explain the flavors that you might get while you're drinking the beer. Um, It's not what you would normally expect out of an amber ale. It's malt forward. You get that. But it also has an aggressive hop profile. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things that kind of always uh, that I always pick up when I'm drinking this beer is I get some bitterness at the tip of my tongue little spiciness mid-palate, and some citrusy notes kind of at the end uh, if Mosaic's doing its job. Um, I don't know if it's done its job as well on this batch as the last one, but it's it's doing it. <laughs> um, so I have always found that to be kind of a, a complex flavor profile, which I enjoyed, and I think that's where Tangled come from. And, of course, uh, aggression is just the hot profile because the IBUs on this are pretty substantial given, you know, that it is an amber ale. Right on. I what uh, what all hops are are in this recipe? Yeah, so it's um, Nugget, um, Simcoe, and Mosaic. And okay. a part of the whole reason for it was I wanted to kind of get some of that spiciness out. And you, you can pick that up from Nugget. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mosaic is the child of Nugget and Simcoe, so it seemed like a, a natural blend that would work well together. And, and I'm, I'm happy with it. It pulls out the, the fruitiness in Simcoe. A lot of times Simcoe, you can get a lot more pine flavor out of but if you there's fruitiness there (laughs) Um, but a lot of times it's what you're pairing it with so Mm. mosaic works pretty well with it right on cool cool so yeah uh we've been having a little bit before we even started the show as we as we took our tour of the facility somebody made us go and tour the facility and thank you again for that you're welcome but (laughs) you can't have a tour without a beer in hand i'm pretty sure that's illegal (laughs) at least in this state it is in washington county (laughs) somebody done twisted our arm but Mm -hmm. uh yeah i like right off the bat looking at it it looks like an amber it does it does it's deceptive (laughs) (laughs) well it is but it isn't because i mean the name kind of 
alludes to what's going on. Well, yeah, the, sure. If you're looking at the chalkboard, it tells you that you know there's a little bit more to it. But yeah, I don't know. It's it's not what I remember of amber ales. It's not what we had as far as amber ales at Lincoln Ave. Correct. It's definitely got that hop to it. It does. This definitely leans in your direction. It does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it it makes me think. I mean, and it's been so long since I've actually had a beer like this, but like the red IPAs of ah, olden days, yes. sure. it, it actually does remind me a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. And, and what's nice is it, it still maintains its amber bones. Mm-hmm. You know, it is still an amber ale at heart, uh, but it's got that extra layer of, of hoppiness. And like you said, a little bit of fruitiness in there as well. So it kind of bridges that gap a little bit. If you're an IPA drinker, but you don't necessarily want to get a you know double dry hopped IPA, punch you in your stupid face type mm-hmm. of beer, you know you want something a little bit lighter. This would be a great option to go for. Thanks, I appreciate it. I mean, like part of the thing that I've always wanted to do as a brewer is just not make the same beer that everybody else is making. Mm-hmm. So I wanted an amber ale. I like amber ales, but um, a lot of times I want a little bit more out of the amber ale. Um, one of my favorite beers is Nugget Nectar. And so naturally my first thought was, I, what do I love about Nugget Nectar? Well, first it's great beer. Mm-hmm. Secondly, it's an amber, theoretically. Um, it's super hoppy. So I like all of that stuff. So I wanted to just kind of make my own twist on that. Sure. Um, this has a much richer grain bill than you'd get out of Nugget Nectar. So you're, you'll pick up more sweetness out of this than you would from, from that beer. Mm-hmm. But like that's part of the inspiration for it. I think most of my beers usually are inspired by another beer that I really, really liked. <laughs> and then I wanted to kind of tweak and make my own. So. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I like where this beer is going. I, mm-hmm. I like that you kind of took things... In a, you know, not necessarily a different direction, but in your own direction. You put your own twist on that. I like that. Thanks. I appreciate it. It's, the, it's also the part that makes it fun. I mean, one of the things as a brewer that I enjoy the most is recipe creation. Mm-hmm. Assuming that I can actually indeed make that recipe at the end. <laughs> That's not always <laughs> a given. Um, but, um, yeah, when it really can, pans out, um, I'm really, really happy about nice. that. It's super fun. So uh, I... You had said earlier that this batch wasn't quite as hoppy as previous batches. Is this one that's kind of a always on tap beer here, or is this sort of a uh, when there's room in the fermenters? I would call it regularly on tap, which um, being at this small a scale means that it'll go away for a few weeks and then come back, and gotcha. then go away for a few weeks and come back. But it's pretty, it's here pretty regularly. Okay. Um, one of the things I'm happy about is I would say that this version tastes just like the version it was supposed to be like and then also like the version that we opened with right so we've made four versions of this beer okay three of them were very consistent Mm -hmm. the fourth one was not (laughs) (laughs) and i can tell you about that one but like i'm i'm pretty happy at this stage to be able to say that yeah we're making pretty consistent beers Mm -hmm. um you guys saw the system back there yes you Mm -hmm. can imagine how that's a little bit more difficult to dial in than Mm -hmm. say a traditional two to four vessel system Right. So, um, you know, to a certain degree, to reach consistency, I'm pretty happy. If you drank this beer right now and you drank it back in November, you would say that's the same beer. Gotcha. So that makes me pretty happy. That's awesome. I'm probably the only person who's noticing that <laughs> citrus on the back end. But, you know, that's just that comes with the territory. But an artist knows his work. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you already mentioned it, but I guess it's best to just jump right into it. Your brewing system here is completely unique, I think, from every other system that I know of in mm-hmm. the Western Pennsylvania area. So, aside from home brewers. Right, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, why don't you just uh, get right into it and tell us about, you know, the uniqueness of your system and kind of why you went that route with it. Sure thing. I... I'll start by just trying to describe it a little bit. And of course, if people come down to Mondays, usually I'm happy to take people in the back and show them around. So it is, though, very different than what you'd normally find, a two to four vessel system where you might find a brewer on a platform punching some buttons, opening a manway and like opening maybe some valves and getting things to go from one place to another. This is, in essence, a glorified a brew in a bag system. So those of you who are might be home brewers, right? You're going to recognize that um, this is what I've been referring to as brew in a basket because it's a, like a ginormous <laughs> brew in a bag <laughs> system. It's um, it's uh, 
it's almost as if you were making uh, pasta, right, in a big colander. Okay. But your grist is going into the colander, and you're lifting it up eventually out of this. So it's all a one-vessel system. So the fermenter is also the boil kettle, mm -hmm. and the mash tun sets inside it. Uh, so essentially, you fill it up with water. You throw your grist into the mash tun. You're going to do your mash like you normally would. You lift that out. You raise the uh, wort that's left up to a boil. You add in your hop additions and all that kind of jazz, whatever the recipe is calling for. Bring it down to the right temperature for yeast pitch, and then you, well, you've popped the lid on it already, but you throw in the, the yeast, and then you're good to go. Awesome. Um, the reason that I wanted to set up this system in part is that I've been a home brewer for a very long time. Um, 1999 is when I started home brewing. And uh, so doing that for so long made me familiar with the process, but it also made me familiar that my biggest weakness as a brewer has always been sanitation. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, anyone who's home brewing knows that that's the key. That is your a number one beer. priority. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my goal was to kind of reduce any pain points in sanitation process, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a heat exchanger. I don't have to worry about cleaning it. I don't have to, you know, handle a lot of different pumps and tons and tons of hoses, right? Mm -hmm. We do have a pump. We have hoses. We, you know, we do all of that stuff, but it's, it's just minimalized, right? There's so many fewer places where we can get an infection that it, it does two things. First, it makes it easier to clean and a little less time intensive. But secondarily, it just reduces the varying points in the process where you could ruin a beer. Mm -hmm. So it makes it pretty easy. The one thing I would say is it would only work at this scale. Like we're a small five barrel system. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you could do seven and a half barrel. No one in their right mind would ever do this <laughs> to like a 20 barrel system. Right. It would never work. You're going to need some mighty big crane rails. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's just for the kind of place we are, you know, your small neighborhood brewery right that's what and we are like looking you know we've been in the back and just looking at the space that you have to work with like this is obviously super advantageous for it for you because you can you have like four systems back there that can all run themselves on their own you don't have to worry about we've been to other places that have very similar uh brewing space like cobble house and abjuration mm -hmm. and they simply just don't have the room to put out you know, what you can right. yeah, at the same level you can. It does help a lot. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, that's a very mobile brew house. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can make a beer and then push it off to the side, hook it up to its own water supply and electric and, you know, everything we need. And just let it hang out there and ferment for a couple of weeks while we pull another fermenter over and start the process again. So we can crank through the beers pretty quick. The hardest thing is just time and effort. Mm hmm Right. Including that two months worth of lagering that you got well, going on yeah, right now. That's true. <laughs> so we've dedicated one tank and we always have a lager going um, in there. And we've had really good luck with our Vienna lager, uh, with oh. our Hellas lager. Mm -hmm. And right now we have a Pilsner in the tank. So, And, and as somebody that enjoys the lager side of things, I appreciate that. For sure. I, and yeah, they've been some of our most popular beers. Um, it's something that you never... One of the things I didn't know before opening the place was what kind of beers will people in this community want? Mm -hmm. I think it was pretty clear that they wanted a variety of beers. And we definitely have folks who are coming in and they want a hazy and they want a fruited sour, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we also have a ton of people who come in and absolutely love the Vienna Lager and the Hellas Lager. And it's very rewarding because those beers take two months for me to make, right? So after that much work, you want to make sure people are liking right. it. Yeah. So was there any other styles that kind of surprised you of how popular they were or even not as popular as you thought they would be? Um, I think that for the most part, everything's been pretty popular. One of the things that has surprised me the most was something I made for St. Patrick's Day. It was called Mint Me One More Time. Okay. And it was a... Uh, uh, mint chocolate stout. Oh, okay. And I, so I made it for St. Patrick's Day, and then I realized, holy crap, I made five barrels of a beer for one <laughs> day holiday. <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow, this beer's not going to sell. And it turns out that, like, people either loved that beer, mm -hmm. like, like, really loved it, or they utterly despised it. Yeah. So we got <laughs> into the habit of just making sure everyone had a sample. And then, like, people would just drink it like crazy. Like a lot of times people would have it as like a dessert beer, their mm -hmm. last beer. And then there were other people who come here and drink four pints of that. Stuff. Oh, geez. And like, yes. they just they <laughs> loved it. Um, so that was a surprising uh, beer. I don't think, 
you know, I don't know. Who knows? I'll never uh, say never. Mint, I, mint is always super polarizing. It is. It is. Like, yeah. Adam doesn't drink it at all. That's he true. I, I would be the one that would take the sample, uh, appreciate <laughs> the craftsmanship of it, and then go somewhere else. <laughs> and then I'm your four points. That I, you did, I got you. I see. I, the I'll, thing that was really great about it, though, was that that beer – it generated a lot of buzz. Mm -hmm. Like in the tap room, people would talk about that beer and they would like talk from table to table and say, what are you having? And then they would either go, oh, I would hate that. Or, oh, wow, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and it it was just a real conversation starter a lot of times. So awesome. Yeah. That was really great. So, uh, one of the things that I appreciate that you recognize early that your clientele likes a variety, but I think it kind of comes almost geographically with the, where you're sitting because we're talking about our friend Kelsey. She lives mm -hmm. in the South Hills and she is, you know, of the mind of like she enjoys hazies and stouts and, you know, a lot of that kind of you know, trendy stuff. But also just being somewhat nestled within Washington County, Washington County, for those outside of Pittsburgh, it's very uh, of a blue collar mentality. So, of course, they're going to be drawn more to classic styles like the Pilsners and the Loggers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, providing all of that is definitely what's going to drive everybody in here. I you, think so, you're too. Gonna get the, you're going to get the highfalutin upper St. Clair people <laughs> down here. That, you know, also just some dude on his way home from work. <laughs> Absolutely true. And a lot of times we get people who will come in, and I'm convinced we've had people here, and it's the first brewery they've been to, and it stuns me. But, like, you know, we'll have people come in, and they're like, I need your lightest beer. <laughs> oh, you know, right. And it's kind of like, well, okay. And I always have something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like right now we've got Pops Imperial Cream Ale. That's a great, um, it's a great beer. If you like a cream ale, it reminds me a little bit of uh, a, a cream ale that I grew up with near Cincinnati. Uh, it was Little King's Cream Ale. Okay. I don't know if anybody knows that, but um, it's, uh, it's very flavorful. I think it's a fun style. Um, and a lot of times people will really like that beer and they won't always notice that it's six and a half percent. So, I mean, there's a reason why Imperial is in the name. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. Six and a half definitely is Imperial for a cream. Ale. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is very smooth and it's crushable for summer. And it is the beer that has made me accidentally drunk more than any other. Awesome. <laughs> So you had said that there were some people that have come here. It seemed like they were the, you know, this is the first time they've ever yeah. been in a proper brewery. Yeah. Have you had any regulars come in that kind of started out? They didn't have any idea what they wanted and then kept coming back and you kind of see their palate kind of expand or anything like that. Have you had any experience with that? Yeah, we've, I've definitely seen that happen. I mean, we've, we've got people who are coming in. A lot of times they'll, they'll come in and they're kind of surprised to find something that they like. Oh. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to keep drinking that. And they will literally drink it until it's off tap. And then they're like, oh, I guess I'll have to try something else. But like some of these folks have been coming in for months now. Mm -hmm. And it's really great to see what they what they experience. Like the Kentucky Common we have right now, that's an interesting beer because mm -hmm. it's almost a light beer. It's brown, but it's very almost lagerish, you know, right. in that it's, it's it's very light. It's very refreshing. It's an easy drinker. And a lot of times you'll find folks who maybe are looking for a brown ale, but it's summer, so I don't have one. Mm -hmm. But, like, they'll like that beer. And then you have folks who might want something really light like a lager. And right now I don't have one because I'm waiting for that Pilsner to, <laughs> to, to, to do its thing. Um, and they'll like that beer. So it's, it's really, that's a fun thing to see. It's sort of a nice happy medium. It is. And with the Kentucky Common, that is a style that, I, I I think through 207 episodes, I don't know that we've ever had that style on the show. I don't think we've ever had it. I know we've talked about it yes. as far as beer history goes because mm -hmm. it is an old style and it's very, like, it's a precursor to the uh, steam ale from California. Yes. Because they're very similar in mm -hmm. brewing style. But, yeah, we've never had one. We've never, we've never had one on the show. Ah, well, maybe that's going to have to show up because that's an interesting style. I mean, it was really prevalent around louisville mm -hmm. um but uh and then this is pre-prohibition but it just died out mm -hmm. right um it's a really interesting thing i'd like i tend to describe it as like a cream ale that's kind of um a little um caramely and a little toasty maybe mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. of the, the grain bill it's got some chocolate malt in it some uh, rye malt in it it's really good and um that beer is just like i really really enjoy it but it it, it completely died out 
the thing that was really fun is we did that as a collab with Whitehorse down at on Racetrack Road. Oh, okay. Berlin, okay. Right? Uh, we've had them on the show before. Yeah. And um, so that beer is was super fun to make. And like historically, that is a beer that you would ship out in mm. barrels before it was done fermenting. And it would just like show up and like, show up finished. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. And uh, when George and I were making that beer, it was done fermenting in eight days and we had it on tap. So oh, it was kind right of on. like, we felt like that was very historically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so. Very nice. So I want to go all the way back to 1999. Yeah, sure. When, when you started your home brewing. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you start getting involved in home brewing and beer in general? I gotcha. Well, um, I, so I'm a professor. I'm actually still a professor down at WJ. Oh, okay. So I finished my PhD at Ohio State. Uh, where and I've just alienated half of your audience and uh, both of your hosts. Okay, uh, but uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm seeing the faces. But um, after Ohio State, of course, I realized I wanted to go teach someplace small, so mm. I went down to a, a college in Kentucky called Center College. Okay, uh, it's about an hour south west of Lexington, but it happened to be in a dry county. Mm. And even though all of my family's from Kentucky, I had no idea of dry county existed right mm -hmm. especially after ohio like i mean you just walk to a grocery store and right. get whatever you want, you know, <laughs> a dry county so i'm i'm living down there and um it's like either i'm going to spend an hour driving up to lexington and then an hour back to have beer <laughs> or i can learn to make my own mm. so i was like i just decided to make my own and i called the first beer um the first good one, uh, Dry County Ale, was just kind of a general oh, nice. you know, screw you to like, <laughs> the, that system. But it was, it, you know, it turned out pretty well. And then I just kind of got in the habit of, of making it. So home brewing is something that stuck with me, like in and out. You mm -hmm. know, I think a lot of home brewers go in and out of it. Like there's a point where you start realizing I'm so tired of sanitizing bottles yes. that I <laughs> yes. never want to do that again. Yep. And then you walk away from it for a few years and then you come back and you're like, oh, I can keg this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, that's great. I only need one or two kegs. And that kind of like re creates more enthusiasm again, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're back into it. So it's one of those things that never really left me completely. But and I always had the passion for it. Excellent. So that's kind of how I ended up opening this place. Yeah, we all, we always like trying to find the, the origin stories of, of yeah. the brewers and stuff like that. How did you get involved? Mm -hmm. That's always good to hear that. A lot of times, you know, most of the things in my life, I'm just a very stubborn person. Like whenever someone <laughs> tells me I can't do a thing or something like that, I, it almost makes me more inclined to do it. <laughs> um, so in this case, you know, being told that I can't buy beer just made it, I'll just make it right. myself. <laughs> <you know? laughs> well, then what's the solution if That's I right. can't buy it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So let me ask you this, is that the, the first recipe that you created, mm -hmm. also the first good recipe you sure. created, <laughs> do you still have that available? And could we see that here in Mondays? I actually do not. Oh, it, no. it went away. I mean, like I've moved several times mm -hmm. and like back in those days, I mean, yeah, okay, I had a computer, but like, you know, I, did, I wasn't like as fastidious as in terms of record keeping mm -hmm. right. as I am now. Uh, so... Like right now, I have every recipe I've made over the last few years, and like I can make it again. Right. And, you know, I probably could create something and call it Dry County Ale, but the <laughs> truth is, it wouldn't, it really wouldn't be. be the same. No. Nah. We'll keep that secret between you and me and the rest of the listeners. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, I feel that. I feel like I can't remember where I've put my old recipes either. Not that I have any plans on marketing anything mm -hmm. to the people, but. Not yet. I just don't know where they're at. <laughs> they're gone. I say, the, big, I, the biggest problem I'm having is I can't remember if it was a red ale or a brown ale. Because <laughs> I kind of feel like if it was, I could just make one and call it dry right. ale, and then it'd be fine. But I just don't know which one it was. So I don't know if anyone remembers me from 1999 in Kentucky in, amongst your listeners. <laughs> but if you do and you remember what dry county ale is, just shoot me a note. Right on. <laughs> That's some very narrow marketing, and it I love is, it. it <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe Michael Moeller can do yes. an investigation into the, what we'll, was we'll, the Dread County. We'll, we'll tag him. Sure, yeah. <laughs> we'll hire him to do freelance investigation of an old <laughs> homebrew recipe. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, for now, though, let's come back to the beer that we do have, the beer that we do know. Yes. The Tangled Aggression Amber. Uh, final thoughts on that. So I'll, I'll go first on that one. I, I, I like what you did with this beer. I, I like how you maintain the maltiness, 
uh, of the amber because I, I, am, I am a malt forward kind of guy. You know, <laughs> I'll die on that hill. I'm all right with uh-huh. that. But uh, I, I appreciate that you, you brought the hops into it as well. And I think this beer is really good to it, – it's sort of a bridge beer where if you're a malt guy – it kind of bridges you towards the hop side of things. If you're a hop guy, it bridges you back towards the malt side of things. So this is a this is a a type of beer that you could probably bring to a group of you know beer enthusiasts, mm-hmm. where somebody is going to find one one side that they're going to like, and and I think this is a really good beer for that. Thanks, I appreciate it. I think it's a meat beer. A meat beer, <laughs> yeah, pairs real good with meat. I do think it does. Yeah, I could see that. Could, yeah, all right. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, it's a food beer. So do you have a specific meat? Nah, all like right. Like pork. <laughs> no, go good. and then gives me a specific. Yeah, I'm like, no. <laughs> well, I mean, give me a second and the brain will come with it. Yeah, all right. I was it's thinking a, steak. Yeah, it could go good with steak. Like I'm down with that. A steak with like uh, a little bit of the Montreal seasoning on Ooh. it. Ooh. Yeah. Good. Okay. Mm. All right. Now we're cooking. I was thinking like pulled pork though, Mm -hmm. uh, with not like not like a Kansas City sauce, but like a mustard sauce. Get more like Carolina barbecue. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm down with that. Yeah. All right. I I haven't had dinner. The brain's going. (laughs) I see that. My interest in this was wondering if I could create an amber ale that both of you would like. Right. Both the guy who likes malt beers and the guy who likes hoppy beers. I was just trying to. I I think you have done that. that. It's it's tricked us enough. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because there was enough malt for Adam, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't overpoweringly caramelly or sweet for me. So, yeah, like, and you put the right hop blend in, Mm -hmm. as I do like mosaic hops. So that's a good one. Me too, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, so I I think this is a good one. Thanks, I appreciate it. Well done. Thanks. Also, you said you were trying to, you you base the recipe off nugget nectar. Which, So if that's your starting point (laughs) Uh and you're trying to mimic that, so yeah, I already love that beer. Yeah, you're going to be all right. (laughs) So it's going to be good. You got there, yeah. So So what do you say we take a quick break? uh Maybe uh, walk over to those taps over there, see what they got going on. Yeah. Maybe draft up another one. Sure. Come back for segment two. Sounds good to me. All right. We will be right back. First Sip Brew Box is a -a one-of-a-kind subscription service for craft beer lovers based right here in Pittsburgh. Every month, First Sip will send you a box full of craft beer enthusiast essentials, including t-shirts, glassware, and even food. Right now, our friends at First Sip Brew Box have an offer for you. Just sign up for a three-month subscription and get your fourth month free. Just enter the code HOPUSA when you sign up at firstsipbrewbox.com. That's H-O-P-U-S-A at checkout to get your fourth month free at firstsipbrewbox.com. Dot com. It's episode 207, live from Monday's Brewing in Washington County, just outside of Pittsburgh. We did a lot of traveling, you know, half hour. That's a lot for us. <laughs> we <laughs> have en- no travel budget, so it's got to be. <laughs> the engine actually warmed up by the time we got here. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> but uh, yes, it is still live from Monday's, and we're still with Sam, and we're still drinking Monday's beers. So that means it's time for Sam to introduce the second beer that we're having tonight. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is the um, Kentucky Common that we've got. This is a collab we did with Whitehorse. We chatted about this a little bit in segment one, so I'll try not to talk too much about it. But um, um, it's a style that I was always interested in, and uh, basically Brendan out at CNC Malt contacted me, and he's like, I've got some six-row. Can you do something with it? And I was like, "Uh, yeah. And so um, I was familiar with the style. I knew that it was brewed with six rows, so we just used it. Um, We tried to make it historically accurate. Uh, There's a little corn in it, um, chocolate malt, rye malt. It's a really, I love the taste of the beer. Um, It's it's one of those beers that like faded away with prohibition. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very common prior to that. Um, but it's you see it other places like actually Necromancer uh, and I think Dancing Gnome did a um, did a collab and made a, a, a Kentucky Common Square mm-hmm. Dancing right Oh okay yep. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and it's mm-hmm. I've had that beer it's really good so they make a great one too I, I really appreciate that 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 style has gone from nobody's talked about it for years to all of a sudden it's prevalent in Pittsburgh right yeah. now in about a Two months span. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I mean, love it. We're seeing that with a lot of things, though, like black IPAs, back on the list. <laughs> I say, and you are all about that. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dancing Gnome is also, they've, they've been dabbling a lot of older styles because mm-hmm. they also put out an alt beer not too long ago yep. that we had on the show. Yep. 
And then obviously Necromancer is always have has their hands in older styles because they did a grisette like out the box mm-hmm. and then a black IPA. <laughs> right. So yeah, we're seeing the resurgence of a lot of old styles as well as a lot of newer twists like hop lagers. Yes. So yeah. I really like it. I think that it it helps all kinds of craft drinkers, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say you're an experienced craft drinker and you've been drinking for a long time. You might be getting palate fatigue from the hazies. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's no maybe about it. <laughs> I know a lot of people that I talk to, they're feeling that way. So they're exploring these new styles. Mm-hmm. Um, you might be new and coming to a brewery, you know, just developing as a craft drinker. And so you're looking for these gateway beers to kind of take you out of this, um, how do I phrase it nicely? This ignorance of mass produced beer. And into that was actually that, a really nice way of putting it. <laughs> I just would have called it the trendy zone. <laughs> into something flavorful. You know? um, I'm, I'm so, stealing that. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go for it. It's out there now. It's in the public domain. <laughs> Anybody can use it. It was but, said on our show, and now it can be a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I guess we should get back to the beer itself, shouldn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Turns out it's really good. Okay. Who'd have thought? <laughs> Who'd have thought? Uh, Who'd have thought Adam would have liked it? I thought it was good. <laughs> Gee, who would have thought Adam, who brews a lot of cream ales on his own, mm-hmm. would have liked a cream style? <laughs> yeah, with a little bit it's of like, caramelization on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Who would have thought? It's, I, it's me. It's not a cream ale progenitor, but it is like... Progenitor? That's a that, 50 that, cent word. Yeah, that would mean it, it came before cream ales, but it didn't. It, it kind of followed cream ales it as did. it moved into the West. Right. Yeah, and so the you know the cream ale came out to try to compete with the German lagers, mm-hmm. and then what you got on with this is basically a, a, a Kentucky twist on it, so to speak, because of the things were available locally, right? That was in a time where people still made beer locally, right? And yeah. It was very you know it's accurate to the time, so yeah. it's good. I'll say on the nose, I, you said it didn't use a whole lot of corn, mm-hmm. uh, but on the nose, I get a lot of the same kind of corn um, notes. That I've gotten from drinking corn whiskey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I wonder if some of that's the rye. It might be. It might be some of the we, rye as well. That we interpret mm-hmm. you know, yeah. that way, you know? But yeah, it, it smells very familiar as corn whiskey, which I got in trouble for drinking in college because corn whiskey <laughs> stinks. <laughs> it does. Oh. And I was drinking it in a class. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, But yeah, uh, flavorful wise, it's just... It goes down really easy. It's, it does. It's very similar to a cream ale. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's... It's not overly sweet, and it's not overly caramelly again. So, yeah, I find it pretty drinkable. But, yeah, with, with this beer, uh, yeah, you could drink a lot of it. It is definitely something that I, I think if somebody is on that macro train, mm-hmm. you can kind of pull them off that with this. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of times that's what happens here in the tap room. You know, usually we get folks, especially here in this area, right? Mm-hmm. Folks are coming in. Um, they are kind of, they're willing to try some stuff we've got. You know, they're like, um, normally I drink uh, Miller Lite. What have you got? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm used, the answer, of course, is nothing like that. Right. <laughs> but I do have some other things, you know. So we do have actually a, a regular straight-up cream ale, and I describe it typically as Miller Lite with flavor. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that's something that then people are like, they'll drink it, and they like it. Yeah. Um, this is also another beer that I'll give people who want a lighter beer or folks sometimes if they want a brown because we make a really good brown ale. I think it's it's a really good beer, but it's just June. You know, right, so right. like, you know, <laughs> I'll make it again fairly soon, but like it's just not right now here. Mm-hmm. And I love this beer as an alternative to that. Like if you came in and you like brown ales, you could drink this and you would really enjoy the flavor of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely say see this as like a summer evening drinking beer. Yes, it's absolutely. not not necessarily tailgate weather beer because right. it's, it's 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 a little heavier, it's a little thicker, a little you know, little little bit much. I, I think this would be the perfect beer for whenever you're starting to have the backyard fire. Mm-hmm. This yeah. would be the good a good beer to start with. Good camping beer, too. a good camping beer. Yeah, yeah. and then I you can that. start to work into your your porters and then your stouts, and then you get into the corn whiskey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then it's a long night. <laughs> That's right. And then you wake up in, you know, a pile of pool noodles in a neighbor's yard. We won't get into that. But, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. good beer, though. Good, mm-hmm. good, easy drinker. And just the one last note about, like, 
what Sam is saying as far as pulling people off that mass-produced train. He already said it at the top, though. It's made with craft malt. It's from a craft maltster in our area. Right. Mm-hmm. So it provides a different agricultural flavor profile than you'll get from mass-produced beer because mm-hmm. mass-produced beer has to taste the same coast to coast. Correct. So you're going to get something unique with this one. Mm-hmm. And yeah. It's really been one of the most interesting things I've learned as a brewer um, in the seven months we've been doing this since I've been um, grabbing stuff from CNC. Really fresh local malt is extremely flavorful. Mm-hmm. If you buy malt from a larger producer, it's great. It's fine. It's tasty. But there's something about having the malt that Brendan malted just two weeks ago, (laughs) Mm -hmm. putting that in a beer, having it in a glass in less than a month. Mm -hmm. And like, it just has a lot of rich flavor. And a lot of times I actually sometimes will hold that beer for a week or two before I put it on in the tap room because it almost needs to mellow out a little bit. Mm. Um, and that's not atypical. You can do that with any malt. But, like, it's, it's very, very true that, like, fresh local ingredients really make yeah. for some incredible flavor. Mm. We had a beer um, just a while back called Bradford's Reserve, and um, it was essentially all the, gro- all the grains were uh, made in Westmoreland, or grown in Westmoreland County, right? Malted in Butler County. Um, and then we made the beer right here. So literally nothing but the hops, which were all Centennial from, you know, Washington, <laughs> were from within 45 minutes of here. Right. And nice. that's one thing that's pretty cool. You can't, you can't get that yeah. if, unless you're into craft and into local. Right. right. And there's definitely something to be said about, you know, you could have driven past, you know, these malts a month ago yeah. while they were still growing. Yeah. In the ground, you could have driven <laughs> right past it. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, that's like when I drive past the farm and I go... Hey, cow, food. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. I'll see you in six to eight weeks. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, just the way we've seen people experimenting with hops and the way local fresh hops have gained priority and, like, the way people like to make beers that are wet hopped, mm-hmm. which are super fresh. You know, we're seeing the same thing now with grains, now mm-hmm. that we have that availability from CNC. So, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing to see. It's really good stuff. I mean, I really like it. Um, I've, I, I think you can also really get, Brendan really knows his craft and he, you can really get a distinguished flavor from it. We were just out at an event at uh, Birch Creek Farmery on Sunday. Mm-hmm. We were serving up some beers and he happened to be there from CNC and he had his biscuit malt there. And so I went over and of course, you know, like if you're brewing beer, you need to eat the ingredients because you need to know what it's going to taste like. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't eat hops. That would <laughs> no. you know, taste horrible. But Every like, home brewer has <laughs> gone through that process. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, the grains you want to munch on. And um, man, their biscuit malt, it tasted so good. Mm-hmm. Like it was all I could do to not like just grab it and like <laughs> go over to where we were pouring beer and just, just munch on it all day. Like, <laughs> granola or something. like popcorn. It, really good. <laughs> it really did. I mean, it was so good that it's got me started thinking about a beer to put it in. Mm. So like, Something like that can simply be the beginning inspiration right. of a beer, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, how can I use this? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of people have done that. I mean, we've done that with hops before. Oh, yeah. Like, I never got around to it because of certain things that happened in the past uh-huh. called the pandemic. But yeah, <laughs> I, I had wanted to try, like, to make a smash with uh, Sabro hops. Oh, sure. Just to, just to see how Sabro hops work. So, yeah, yeah just mm-hmm. having those ingredients available. But, yeah. I love that idea. I love smash beers. Um, it's really funny because a lot of times we confuse people because we have a smash sour series, which is <laughs> our sour. And everyone thinks, uh, like, well, sometimes if people know about brewing, they think, oh, it's a single malt, single hop beer. Yeah. And then kind of like, no, we, it's just different. Um, but um, I do love that. I like what Cinderlands is, is doing with mm-hmm. it, you know, and like other places as well. But, like, that's a great way to really kind of come to understand the character of a hop. I think the really hard, I think one of the most fun things about brewing and also one of the most challenging things is what are those hops going to taste like? How's that flavor going to manifest and what's that aroma going to manifest like when you blend them together? Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I mean, there are ways to do that. You can make a hop tea. You can figure out these things. But, um, you know, sometimes I feel like you never really know until it really manifests Mm -hmm. in the beer itself. Sometimes you just got to go do it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So with that, let's jump back a little bit into your history. We talked, sure. we touched on your home brewing history starting in 1999, but we just want to jump back even more and kind of get more uh, an idea of like how long before 
you were really, really, really into home brewing. Mm -hmm. Like how, what was like your kind of greatest achievement as a home brewer? What were your greatest recipes? Give, um, give us the greatest hits of your yes, or even greatest follies. Well, we'll get we'll get to the follies, but yeah. give, give us the hits first, and then give us the nightmare stories well, after. <laughs> there's always plenty of follies. I mean, I have those even as a pro brewer, um, <laughs> and uh, I will unfortunately share those with you if you want. It's painful, but well, you know, they're they're good lessons. I think that um, you know, I never really got into competitions or anything like that. So, like, mm. I don't have ribbons or you mm. know anything like that. I think the thing that I always really enjoyed was when I would give beers to people and they absolutely loved them. Because, like, you can tell when a person is being nice to you and just saying, oh, I like your beer, mm -hmm. versus when they say, like, I really like your beer, or that's the best beer I ever had. We know the first one very well. Yeah. I don't know the second right. one. <laughs> we'll get there, Steve. We'll get there. <laughs> um, I've had some really good luck with stouts, actually. I, I make really different stouts, and, mm -hmm. and it's the stout that we make here, the base stout beer is uh you know really just a dry irish stout oh, uh, i mean okay. like everybody i know that everybody's making these very adjunct rich pastry stouts like really powerful stouts and don't mm -hmm. get me wrong i enjoy them i, <laughs> I drink them occasionally i drink one of them you know <laughs> but like um i think that for the kind of place we are and the kind of community we are that really good base stout is the beer that's going to sell well I mean, remember, all my customers are up and down Route 19, mm -hmm. so they've got to drive. Right? right. And so in the same way that the Irish drink stout in between whiskeys so that they, <laughs> <laughs> they can last longer, I need a stout that folks can drink. I can't serve an 11% right. stout. Right. You can't come yeah. in here and start right. serving sledgehammers at them. <laughs> yeah. But I think that the stout was probably the first um, beer that I would say I really felt that I perfected. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely made Dry County Ale a lot um, when I remembered what it was. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, whatever that would be. Um, I, uh, I always experimented with different styles, and sometimes people ask me the question, like, what kind of beer do you most like to make? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, I've yet to meet a beer that I don't like to make. I might not make it again, but I'm always interested in making it once. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that experimentation part. I think that's one reason why we'll always be a small neighborhood brewery, right? Because this is the place that I'm always going to be able to make something just weird mm -hmm. because I wanted to or because someone said, hey, have you ever used pawpaws in a beer before? I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's like a fruit that's local to this area. I, I'm it's, not familiar with that. What is that? It's a weird fruit that I don't <laughs> really understand myself. It's a little bit <laughs> banana mango-y. But, like, the farmer that gives us our grain, right, mentioned it to mm. me, and he's kind of like, can you make a beer with it? And I was like, well, I don't know that that's on the list of uh, already approved ingredients, but I can get <laughs> approval for right. it, and I can put it in a beer. Um, and it, it sounds kind of interesting, and that would be very local, and, like, you yeah. know, I could, I could see myself doing that. But a lot of what I did as a home brewer was just kind of figure out things that were just a little bit different and try to make something that wasn't, the same beer. Now, I, I definitely started out trying to make the same beers, mm -hmm. right? Everyone starts out that way. You're kind of like, oh, I like Sam Adams. I'll make a Marzen. Right. You know, like, let's see how that goes. And mine were horrible. But, like, you know, you, you start with those kinds of things. But then you start, I think, thinking about what could I do that's really different that mm -hmm. someone else hasn't done before? And those are the beers that, you know, I've been doing that, I think, for a very long time, just trying to come up with Beers that are interesting and different, and sometimes you hit, and sometimes you miss. Right. And, you know, now at this level, you got to hit more often than not, mm -hmm. um, but it's fun. The experimentation still happens. Having that little pilot system back there means that I can continue to make beers that I might not normally make, because I can make 15 gallons of it, mm -hmm. and somebody's going to drink it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, you know, if not, you know, we'll pour it out. No big but, loss. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's super fun. I've never, ever been bored by a beer that I've made. I've been panicked by beer. <laughs> I have worried, you know, incessantly about certain beers. But in general, I have never found a beer that I haven't enjoyed making. Mm. I, I, some, I think we've noticed that any of the small breweries that still have a pilot system that the brewer can play on, 
Like they, the Brewer seems a little bit more happy. Yes, because they're, uh, yeah. they're not beholden to always making a hit on the big giant system. Mm, they, That's true. <laughs> they still have that playground. Yeah, yeah, they still have a playground. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I'm always more nervous about the big beers. Um, mm. Except, I guess at this point now, after seven months of it, I'm starting to feel pretty comfortable. Yeah, I know that a lot of times we might make a beer that we don't plan on, mm-hmm. uh, or it doesn't go the right way. But I can usually salvage it and make a beer out of it. Right. So there was this. Uh, do you want that story? I've got. Oh, if you want to tell it. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> so um, there was. Uh, I think this would be the third batch. So we enjoyed the fourth batch of Tangled Aggression, but the mm-hmm. third batch did not quite work out. We had a problem with our mash. I think the problem was that I didn't put in the right grains. So then we had a stuck mash, and then we had a problem where I was kind of estimating what the right, right hop profile should be on the fly. Mm. So in essence, what we ended up with was a beer that was not as, um, as malt heavy, right? Was more hoppy. So we just basically called it hop you in the face amber. Mm. And oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> basically that's, I think, what we're going to call every beer that doesn't quite work out. It's a hoppy <laughs> beer. It's just going to be like hop you in the face brown. <laughs> or hop you in the face, you know, whatever. Hand it over to the marketing department. Exactly. <laughs> So now you have the secret menu decoder. Exactly. <laughs> you come yeah, down to if Monday. you see hop you in the face, you know that it wasn't quite what it was supposed to be. <laughs> that one went sideways. That's a That's Tuesday's right. beer. <laughs> but it was actually, it was a good beer. It's like some people really liked it. It wasn't Tangled Aggression, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I couldn't, I couldn't call it that. Right. right. I wasn't going to mislead people. But it was a fine beer, and we drank it and enjoyed it, and it did pretty well. So nice. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. So you gave us a folly on, on the professional side, I going did. back to your, your home brewing oh, side. <laughs> yeah, sure. And give, give us something that, if nothing else, was probably you know a folly that turned into a, a, a lesson that you've carried on with you. Well, I, I don't know if I've carried the lesson on, but I can tell you that one of the funniest follies as a home brewer was just uh, over putting too much sugar in and over carbonating the second oh, the, no. the bottle conditioning. Ooh. Oh no! <laughs> to a marvelous, the perfect spot, right? So it didn't, you know, there were no bottle explosions. Okay. But every one when you popped it was just like a champagne bottle. <laughs> yeah. It would shoot <laughs> like literally there would be maybe fifteen percent of that beer left in the bottle, <laughs> and it was just like it was like a party event. Like we, you know, a lot Whether of times. What did it or not? <laughs> I know. A lot of times I would actively not tell people about it. Right, I would just hand them a beer. <laughs> they would pop it. You know, I'd always try to make sure they were pointing in the, you know, a safe direction. Right. But like, yeah. So that was miserable because like that whole batch went right. went south. Mm-hmm. And I'm still not convinced if there was an infection because we drank the beer and it seemed okay, mm-hmm. or if it was just um, too much sugar in the bottle conditioning, which I suspect is what it really was, yeah. or it would have tasted bad. We right. it tasted pretty good once right. you actually could drink. The 15% of it. was left. That was left, yeah. yeah. So going from the home brewing side mm-hmm. to the commercial side, uh, w- can you tell us a little bit about that, how you decided to make that leap, make that jump? What was, was there a deciding factor? Was there an epiphany? Uh, what happened? What drove you to, to do that, to go on to the commercial side of things? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, a lot of what drove it was just uh, my own professional trajectory, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm a professor down at w and and I don't want to be one of those guys who's in the classroom for too long, if you know what I mean. Like, we've all experienced teachers like that, and every teacher is different. The time range that you're effective, mm-hmm. it's different. I just wanted to make sure that I had something passionate to transition into. So for me, this has worked out pretty well. I, in a lot of ways, I see the tap room as a continuation of the classroom. Oh, okay. Oh, I like that. There's a lot of um, W&J alum who come in. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times we'll sit around and talk about their professional development, something like that. So in a lot of ways, this is a continuation of that, that work. This is just a path where I knew I needed something I was incredibly passionate about to move into before I was ready to leave, you know, being a professor. But also I had to build it while I was young enough to have the energy to work right, 20 right. hours a day <laughs> <laughs> for a couple of years. So um, that was really kind of the main thought behind finding what that was. And then once I realized that brewing was the thing that had stuck with me, the thing I love about brewing, it is both art and science. Like mm-hmm. there's a craft to it. It is literally the wedding of both of those th- th- those different approaches to working with items, right? So 
it being both art and science, that's been the thing that's made me the most happy as a professional in any endeavor in my life. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to keep going with that. And I like to make things. This is a perfect opportunity to keep doing that, you know, building this place out and making beer. It's awesome. very rewarding. So I think that I was on an alumni trip. I, I take students in, uh, out to the Southwest where I did a lot of my field research. And a couple years ago, I took a group of alumni and that's when I really started thinking, maybe I can do this. And then I came back, wrote up the business plan, did it. Um, I was emailing Andrew Witchy, and we were talking about some things. It was really good because we were having a lot of conversations about, um, you know, at that time he was thinking about doing a lot more traditional styles. I was interested in the variety of beer. We were just talking about that. And then at one point I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to do this. And so I did, and he was like, good luck. You know, <laughs> I was like, it takes nine you know, nine times longer than you think. And he was right about everything, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we managed, basically managed to pull it off in about the time that we said we would, even awesome. with a pandemic. I mean, at one point I thought maybe I'll be done in August and mm -hmm. it ended up being October. But like, you know, that's, that's pretty good yeah, when you consider. Yeah. Consider, you know, yeah, I, every brewer that we've talked to about that, uh -huh. every single one has the same story. For sure, you know. We thought for we were sure. going to be open X. Turns out <laughs> it was four months later. Right. Yeah. But at least it wasn't four years later, right. which right. could have easily mm -hmm. have happened. So it was it was really good. And, uh, you know, a lot of that I'm going to give credit and shout outs to everyone in the community, like the brewing community. Mm -hmm. Everything that everybody says about how collaborative the brewing community is, is absolutely true. Everyone's willing to help anyone, you know, at any time. It's just really fantastic. Can't Cannot tell you how rewarding it is to be a part of an industry where everybody just wants everyone else to succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really great. Yeah. yeah. And that's another story we hear time and time again as well. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, of how, you know, collaborative and, and like you said, you know, just everybody's willing to help and pitch in where they can. Yep. Yeah. And even not just brewers, I would even say that this brewery is the result of like people in the community coming together. I can mm -hmm. easily think of two dozen people who've come and helped with varying things like painting mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, Dev who like helped me put this wood up that's like all over here. Like we've got a beer. Our brown is called Dev's Barn Wood because it's <laughs> named after like that. Um, you know, folks who there were people that were crazy enough to help me build that gantry back there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That was nuts we yeah. probably could have died or maimed ourselves <laughs> but we managed to pull it off you know and like there's you know so many people who've come together and kind of built this place that it really does belong to the community it's really mm -hmm. great that's very awesome. rewarding yeah. yeah that's another thing we're seeing as well is these smaller neighborhood breweries open up you know we saw it first with lincoln ave for, mm -hmm. the, for sure because they had just volunteers coming out yep helping them rebuild that place and get it in ship shape but you know all the other smaller ones, like I'm thinking like Alder Genius now, and then mm -hmm. uh, Fermata that's also going to open in the Enbridge. You know, I know those communities are coming in to help those, you know, help those breweries. And then obviously you're telling us your story of the same yep. thing because, you know, these outlying, outer lying outside of Pittsburgh areas, they want breweries. Right. Yeah, but for sure. They don't want to drive bridges and tunnels and right. up and down <laughs> I know. busted ass 79 yeah, <laughs> right now. 79 is a tough drive yeah. right these days. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, not everybody can live in Lawrenceville or Millvale. Right. Yeah. So we need our breweries too. Yeah, people want these places. So, yeah, of course, you're going to find people who want to come in. They want to help. They want to mm -hmm. open them up and then, you know, just make it their spot. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we've seen that happen. It's really great. Yeah. It's really rewarding. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So just uh, another thing we want to touch on is what kind of interests, you, you've mentioned how you're a professor, and I believe you mentioned off mic that you're an archaeologist, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, what kind of other outside influences have had an impact on the brewing in the brewery itself? You know, I think probably the most has just been how much travel I've been able to do. I mean, one reason I wanted to be a professor was so I could do field research every summer and travel. So I've spent so much time out west, and that's really where, you know, the craft brewery explosion happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent mm -hmm. so much time in Colorado. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I still remember I, I lived for a year in Cortez, Colorado, and there's this little, it, it had its brewery as well, but like there's this little mountain town called Dolores just, you know, 40 minutes up the highway. And it's only 300 people. There's one road, and then all the <laughs> other roads are dirt. And like... It had a brewery, nice. and it was a good one. And it was just one of those kinds of things where 
that was back in the 90s, right? So mm -hmm. well before we saw the explosion in this region. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of that travel was really something that motivated me and also helped me kind of helped shape my views on craft brewing like the whole time. Like I was at Deschutes when it was a little place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was at a lot of these like really incredible breweries that we know of now when they were really nothing but like a metal shed and like <laughs> something happened there. And so sometimes it's really weird, you know, but they've made great beer. They made great beer in the nineties. They make great beer today. And it's just really fun to see all that happen and that, and have it's, how it's grown up all over the country. So especially out West where it was happening early and especially in California and Colorado and the North Pacific Northwest, Seattle, you know? Mm. Um, and then, um, it, one of the things that's been fun about, like, I moved to Pittsburgh in 2003, so, like, back then there was not a lot of breweries in this area, mm. just a few classics, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really exploded, and, like, this is kind of what I was always hoping would happen, and it's pretty fun to be a part of it now. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting thing I just kind of thought about while you were saying about that small town in Dolores. Yeah. you got to wonder, is Colorado's uh, brewery scape like, is that out of necessity because of how snowed in they get and how remote it can get? Yeah. I, that, I, honestly, I can I've never see thought a lot about that. that. I, mean, I, like I a, mean, it it totally could be. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I could be something for the audience to that, email us. <laughs> for tell, sure. Tell us. I'd be interested to know. I don't know how many Colorado listeners you have, but like, some. <laughs> some, yeah. But some. like, I, I can totally see that. Like, I mean, it's not atypical to get snowed in, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, right. like, it, and it makes total sense. Like, I honestly was thinking worry. about The Shining. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I, was, I was like, man, if I was snowed in the Shining Hotel, what's the nearest brewery? See, I mean, it, we have a perfect example right in front of us because yeah. Sam was in a dry county. That's true. Right. Yeah. So yeah. necessity causes it. Necessity, necessity causes, causes it. it. That's, That's right. very true. Yeah, yeah. So to me, I think we have our answer right in front of us. Could be. <laughs> but, you know, maybe somebody wants to correct us. I don't know. <laughs> but it just, I just thought about it. That's all. Yeah. I do think that beer is a staple, you know, mm -hmm. like bread and, you know, various other things that we yeah. might have to have to live. So man cannot live in bread and water alone. <laughs> Not alone. We can put them together and make beer. That's right. <laughs> so you, you had talked about seeing, you know, a lot of the rise of the, a lot of the Colorado breweries in California and Pacific Northwest, you know, their expansions. Uh, is there anything for Mondays uh, you're looking to expand or things you're looking to start to get into now that you've kind of established yourself? Well, we do have a barrel program, which is one barrel. So that's, that's pretty fantastic. exciting. We saw yeah, it. That's right. that's it. We saw the barrel. The barrel. That's right. So if you come to Mondays, you can see the barrel, which is our, our barrel program. Um, I think that we're still so young. We're just trying to get, you know, trying to really make sure that we're doing a really good job. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm really big into quality. There, there, I just, I won't serve a bad beer. And I... Um, I feel comfortable saying that even more so now because I think that I was I said that for some like article before I ever <laughs> opened. Right. And um, then I made a Kolsch uh, a couple months ago, and I have to say it did not turn out well. Mm. And uh, I dumped it, 140 gallons of it oh, down down oh. the drain. Um, so now I can say with authority that I will not serve a beer that's not adequate. I tasted it. I tried it. I gave some samples out in the tap room. I said, well, okay, this is not really a Kolsch. It looks like a Belgian wit. We could call it that. And then I tasted it and I was like, Meh, no. You know, every other beer up on that list is good. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to serve this. Don't put mm -hmm. out a clunker. Exactly. So I think that right now everything's just about really dialing it in and making everything as good as it can possibly be. Awesome. Um, I think that's just, I mean, I don't want to seem as if I don't have lofty goals. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure that I might have some in the future, but right now what I really care about the most is making the absolute best beer I can and not going out of business. So <laughs> like, and the pandemic of course was a big right. part of that. Right. You know, of course you open in a pandemic and that's not exactly good timing. Right. right. Uh, but you know, a brewery is just like that. I mean, there's so much involved as far as licensing and everything else. It's just a giant boulder that once it's rolling down the mountain, you can't stop it. Mm -hmm. All you can do is like ride along and like open when you can and hope for the best. Hope for the best. <laughs> that's right. Right on, right on. So what do you say we get back to uh, the beer that we're drinking? Well, we're drinking. Yes, it went we're fast. It's Honestly, gone. we yeah. drank that very fast. <laughs> it's All gone, gone, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> yes. The pre-prohibition that is the uh, Kentucky Common. 
Steve, I'll let you go first. What did you think of this beer? I enjoyed it. It's, like I've already said at like the top of the segment, it's, it's nice and easy drinking. Mm-hmm. It's not like a tailgate crusher, not even like a lawnmower beer per se, but it's like a camping beer. Mm-hmm. It's a, uh, again, something else you could pair with meat, but this is, <laughs> yeah. more, this is more of a hot dog hamburger. Oh, I could sure, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 More of a hot dog hamburger. Definitely. It's 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 simpler in its flavor profile, so you don't want to, you know, pair it with something too too crazy because something too too crazy will just overwhelm the beer. Right. That's a good point. The amber was more rich. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You needed something bigger for that. Yeah. The, the amber had had that spice that you could pair with a more gamier meat or anything. But you know, this was this is a hot dog hamburger beer. Yeah. Nice on the grill. Take it camping with you. Uh, Overall, yeah, it has that interesting corn nose that I noticed. Mm-hmm. It could be corn, could be rye, but, you know, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, otherwise, it, it is something out of the common. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're used to, like, Genesee cream ale, mm-hmm. this, is, this has a little more body and richness to it Agreed. than Genesee. So, Agreed. Yeah. yeah, this is definitely a good beer, especially if uh, outdoor activities – in the evening, this would be perfect. I think if you get yourself a couple of crawlers or growlers of this and uh, take it with you, you'll have yourself a time. It's a cornhole beer because there's corn in it. Oh, See, get it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do think you've got something going on, though, when you're talking about the timing of it. I see this as the perfect, like the sun's going down. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's not night yet, but the sun's going mm-hmm. down. It's starting to get cooler. It's not hot. You know, yeah. it goes really well. The other thing I was going to say about this is, uh, because we were talking about uh, smash beers earlier, Mm -hmm. it's just cluster in this beer. Okay. Okay. Uh, And one of the things that this really taught me was how nice, uh, just if you just need some general bitterness, Mm -hmm. cluster is a really nice hop for that, Mm -hmm. especially if you don't want the hop to take precedence over it. But, like, you need a little bitterness in there, and if, when you're drinking it, you can tell it's there mm-hmm. to offset that sweetness that would otherwise overwhelm this beer. Right. It gives you a nice so, balance. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm really happy with how that played out. Yeah. yeah. I'd say so, too. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a very nice, balanced beer. So check it out. Uh, with that, though, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back with segment three. We have a quiz devised by Adam. And we also might have a special guest. And we'll have another beer. We that is lo- not the special guest. We got a lot no. of things going on, so That's come right. back. <laughs> please, please come back. <laughs> We're that lonely. Sound, that sounded a little desperate. <laughs> We're not that desperate for listeners. We're good. <laughs> say, we got through the second segment. If they're still listening, yeah. they're hooked by now. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> so, all right, we will be right back. You know what pairs nicely with a good beer? A bad movie. And that's exactly what we do at Hops and Box Office Flops, the Internet's premier podcast dedicated to reviewing bad movies and mostly good beers. So join us on a hop-fueled excursion through some of Hollywood's biggest bombs. We've covered everything from the fungus-laden streets of Dino Hatton with the Super Mario Brothers to the oddly horny felines of Cats 2019. You can find our show on any of your finest podcast providers. And follow us on social media at Hops and B.O. Flops. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll drink your face off. It's episode 207 of the Hop Nation USA podcast, and we're still live at Monday's Brewing on a Tuesday, released on a Friday. That's at Solomon Grundy. (laughs) Who? Huh? DC Comics reference. People get it. People like it. Okay. (laughs) People will like it. Not you, but other people will. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. Yes. This is very true. But yes, we're still here at Mondays, and my co-host Adam is here. And our uh, brewery host, because he's hosting us in our in his brewery, Sam. Yes. It's not our brewery. Us. No. That's he's, true. He's hosting <laughs> us that, in his brewery. <laughs> given the like the big checks that I have to write for <laughs> loans, I'm pretty sure it's mine. Yeah. <laughs> That's really the bank still. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Sam is still here with us. And joining us, special guest who's been watching, waiting in the wings, we have the Pittsburgh Beer Douche, Mike. And first off, why did you name yourself the Beer Douche on Instagram? You're, you're Mike on Twitter. Why do you got to be <laughs> so self-deprecating? That's right. You're good people. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having me. This is the thrill of a lifetime. Uh, Happy to have you. Happy to have you. <laughs> yeah. So why the douche? Well, any... Like, with any great idea, it came from drinking 
lots of beer and it actually was here at Mondays uh, <laughs> that, we, that some of us do every once in a while. You know, I had a lot of free time because of the pandemic mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. wasn't doing as much as I used to be doing, like everyone knows. <laughs> um, so I decided, you know, I see all these other Instagram accounts out there, PGH Beer Dad, PGH Beer Moms, etc. Why can't I have an account? By etc., you mean the Brutifuls, right? Exactly. Hello, <laughs> Brutifuls. Shout out to them. Shout out. Why the douche? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, basically, you know, craft beer drinkers do c- somewhat get the, uh, they come off as we douchey. Get, we get a stigma. Yeah, yeah they sure. get a stigma. What? You know? yeah. <laughs> no, never. So, <laughs> Surely such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought the name made sense. Not the time, you know, I was, like I had mentioned, was drinking heavily. So mm-hmm. I didn't know what the account would be, <laughs> would become. And I still don't know. Um, but yeah, that's that's the basic backstory of right. it. So if I, if I can give you a tip, uh-huh. you have to douche it up more. Yeah, <laughs> you're not you're you're not enough. <laughs> you can cultivate a personality. We we will understand and know you, and other people outside of the world will know you as just you know, fair-handed Mike who likes a beer Mondays. But if you're on Instagram. You're gonna have to start turning your hat backwards, wearing a lime green hat. <laughs> Full on wraparounds and pop that collar always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Do, it, do it up more. Yeah. Just yeah. really lean into the name. <laughs> All right, yeah. I would like to see that image. I would I'd like to see that image. Yeah. Wrap around pit vipers from the early nineties. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's make that happen. Puka shell necklace. Oh, oh geez. pick Puka one up shell, for sure. Get one where, if you can. Where can you even get one of those? Yeah, Amazon. You can get everything on yeah, Amazon. Amazon. Oh, yeah. That's true. Get one on Etsy. Support support a small creator. That's right. So, for clarity's sake, for the remainder of the episode, do you prefer being called Mike or the douche? Uh, let, I mean, let's go with the douche. I all right, then. Okay. Excellent. All right then. Excellent. He's going all in on his Instagram <laughs> influencer. All right. So, we'll refer to you as the douche for now. Uh, but, Sam, why don't you take us into beer three? Oh, sure. All right. So, beer three is our rebellious rye. Um, and I'm still waiting for the cease and desist letter to tell me that I can't <laughs> call it that. But for right now, that's what it's called. Yes. The inspiration for this beer came from a, a brewery in Oklahoma City, actually. I was oh. traveling out to the southwest. I had a beer there called Ride IPA. Okay. Uh, it's a double IPA. You have had it? Yeah, I actually lived in Oklahoma for five oh, years. Oh, fantastic. Oh, All right. Shit. Shit. We just, we just now learned this about each oh, other, yeah, yeah. and like the douche and I have known <laughs> each other for months. Well, anyhow, that beer was exquisite. So I was you know, driving through Oklahoma City. I enjoyed that beer so much, I had to leave my truck parked at the brewery, <laughs> Uber back to the hotel, and Uber back to get my truck the next day. Mm. It was a double IPA, but like still, it was, it was just so good. And I thought, this is fantastic. And much in the same way that I love Nugget Nectar, and so I came up with some kind of play on that, I wanted to do something like that. But I also wanted to come up with something that was a little lower ABV so that people didn't have to Uber away from my <laughs> all the time. <laughs> they, so, they learn from your experience. Exactly. <laughs> Benefits. Exactly. So this is a single IPA, uh, but very, very rich um, in terms of the quantity of rye that's used in mm-hmm. that. And so if you've ever brewed with rye, you know what a pain in the ass that is. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely miserable, but... It's worth the work. Like the flavor that comes off of it is really significant. And um, I think one of the things I'm still trying to dial in is the right amount of hops. I really like the grain bill right now as it is. I think I might like a little more hop kick. I dialed it up on this version of it. Mm -hmm. This beer does taste like the earlier versions and we've had it three times. So I'm happy with that, you know, consistent. But I still would like a little more bitterness maybe in this beer, but I'll be interested in seeing what you guys think about it. This has been a really popular beer. We sold, this beer sold on our opening weekend. It like sold out. Like, awesome. Cool. It was great, uh, but also we thought it would last longer. <laughs> uh, but people love this beer. So then I was like, well, we'll make more of it and make, you know, and it's just a style that I knew I liked, but I mm-hmm. didn't know that other people would like. And it's not something you find a lot. Like a, a rye yeah. IPA is just not something you're going to find a lot of. Um, and that was kind of the idea behind it. Something that you don't find everywhere else mm-hmm. and something that was really good beer. Yeah. Right on. 
Yeah, I remember a lot of rye IPAs, and a lot of them were red rye IPAs mm-hmm. you know, back in the early 2000s or mm-hmm. so. Uh, the last one we had on the show, unfortunately, I think was Brewdog. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. Well, no, but it was a good, it was a good beer, and that's why I picked it up. I'm not going to – of their beer portfolio, they don't have a lot of good ones, but the Silent Assassin Rye IPA was a good fair. one. That's yeah, fair. that's and a good point. It, it Anybody – I mean, honestly, that's true. Like I like, to, I like to get that way sometimes, too. I'm kind of like, oh, that was made by a larger place. Yeah. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is – there's some really good beers made by larger there places. Are. Right. And the more I make beer and the more I realize how hard it is to be consistent, geez, man, that gives me a lot of respect. <laughs> yeah. Even for the major producers, if you can make that same beer in multiple factories all over the country all the time, that's mm-hmm. pretty impressive. Yeah. I might not like it, but from, like from it's the an science impressive point, yeah, standpoint. From the science point of view, that's very impressive. Yeah. Right. Yeah, brewing on a small scale is an art. Brewing on a large scale is a science. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 100%. But that, let's talk about the small scale. Yeah, <laughs> let's, sure. let's, let's get back to this rebellious rye. Uh, we've been sipping on this. Uh, full disclosure, a little pull behind the curtain. We were drinking this before we even started recording. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is a good beer. I like this. Thanks. You like this? I actually do. <laughs> it's a rye IPA. Wow. You I like know. <laughs> I know. I actually do like this. Um, yeah, I kind of understand why you do that. There is, a, it is very, very malt forward, and I will agree with you, Sam. I kind of wish there was a little more yep. hop bite to it. Nope, keep so it right too. where it is. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what hops are in it, though? Actually, again, I'm going to go back to Nugget, which okay. is one of my favorites. Um, but like, I, what I was trying to do is a lot of times we think rye is spicy, mm-hmm. right? The truth of the matter is rye's not all that spicy, so I tried to spice it up through Nugget, which I do feel has a little spiciness to mm-hmm. it. Um, there's some other hops in there. I'd, at this stage in the podcast, I'd have to go look at my software <laughs> and remember what they are. But Nugget's the primary uh, right. uh, presence there, just to give it that spiciness. Yeah. And um, the combination with the rye, I really feel like it gives us that. I mean, sometimes I think what we're trying to do as brewers is give people the perception that they're looking for, mm-hmm. the thing that we think is there. Mm-hmm. And uh, with rye, I think that's a very touchy place, right? I mean, if you've had rye and breads, mm-hmm. it's all over the place. It can be doughy. It can be a little spicy. It can be in the middle. You know, So that's kind of why I tried to do it more on the hop side than anything else. This has a surprisingly high IBU number, <laughs> but it could go more. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do. I, I agree it with you. It could go more. <laughs> it just, and again, it just harkens back to the, the rye IPAs I remember from the past were a lot more spicier than this. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, I mean, if you want to bring it back like that, <laughs> or you can leave it drinkable for Adam. Thank but, you. But overall, yeah, it has, it, has that, it has a definitively more interesting profile than, like, what we had from the Amber. Mm-hmm. It is, it, it, I find it a little bit drier as it well. It is drier, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that I give credit to the yeast. I mean, just like it, it almost always over attenuates, which is good. But that also gives you that nice dry mm-hmm. component mm-hmm. on it. I think that's something that I could work on for the amber, maybe a little bit, make might make that a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I really love how it how it works in this beer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I like the way the amber drinks. I just think this sets itself apart in that way. It's so, true. They are mm-hmm. different. I yeah. mean. I mean, a lot of times you come in and you can say, oh, well, here's like three or four beers that are all in this brown, amber mid-range, right? Mm -hmm. What do I, how are they, how could they possibly be different? But if you taste them, they're really different. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't really set out to do that this episode because, I mean, you you do have like other things on tap. You have a hazy IPA. You have some sours that we could have tried. But we wound up kind of doing this kind of conglomeration of like very similar styles with very similar ingredients, but... You know, here's how they differ. Well, and, and here's the thing, is that those are the three that we're going to try on air. Right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure, maybe next week if we think about it, we'll probably talk about what we had off air. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yes. That'd be a nice addendum. Do you guys yeah. ever do bonus episodes? We could do uh, a sour bonus of. episode. <laughs> we're very lazy. But yeah. <laughs> no, it's not <laughs> easy. But uh, <laughs> at one point, we will figure out to do a Patreon. <laughs> yes, we'll get there eventually. We're just, we're just not self-confident enough. <laughs> right. But uh, I, I did want to go over to a brand new palette on the show, The Douche. <laughs> You, you, you have not chimed in on the beer yet. What are your thoughts on this beer? This beer sucks. 
Oh, oh. hit him he's with the douche. Oh. He, he's embracing the douche. I love it. That was a very douchey comment. <laughs> Just kidding. This beer is delicious, like every single beer at Mondays is. Um, and I also would love to give Sam a shout out for making it lower ABV. Uh, so people didn't have to take Ubers out of here because it's almost impossible to get an Uber. <laughs> yeah, it is impossible <laughs> to get an Uber from here. We yet. know from experience. <laughs> I've had to drive people home, which I shouldn't be saying. That's a, that's another thing a douche wouldn't do. Is right. right. It's very undouche like it is. Shit. <laughs> I'm working. I'll work on it, guys. You're the nicest douche I've ever yeah. met. We're finding that hard to go like six uh, minutes in. Totally I know. True. Too easy. <laughs> that's the irony of the douche label. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess that's where what I'm going towards is irony, but yeah, douche maybe, irony. Maybe, we'll, I like maybe it. I'll switch it up at some point. <laughs> Who knows? Well, while you're trying to find that, it is time for our segment three game. We like to usually lighten things up a little bit uh, here in the third segment, and so we have devised a little bit of a quiz. I did not know there would be a quiz. There is a quiz. Don't worry. There, we're, you was know. the quiz in the like outline? I don't think I was Yes, it, all it, it said was, was. It was on the third page. All it said was quiz. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh I got it. I got it. But you're a professor, so I know. You know we yeah, had to right. tell totally the <laughs> Yeah. So, it's kind of fun. It's a nice twist. So this is a, a, this is a quiz based on the days of the week. Oh, nice. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So how this is set up is I'm going to give you the answer, mm-hmm. and you get two points if you are able to answer the question without any options provided to you. All right. You get two points. If you have no idea what the answer would be or you need a little bit of help, I'll give you four answers, and if you answer correctly, you get one point. And if I'm wrong? You get squat. Okay. Mm. <laughs> And then it goes to the next person to steal? Nope, the hell with it. Oh, man. Uh, Come on, we've always done the steal. All right, all right. I'll I'll give you the steal. I'll give you the steal. Yes. Peer pressure. We've always done the steal. Stop trying to change my rules. (laughs) You know, I'm not a competitive person, but I feel very competitive towards the douche. (laughs) I feel like I need to beat the douche. Oh, yeah, because if you don't, he'll rub it in your face. He totally does. Because he's a douche. (laughs) Yes. Exactly. So then, Sam, you, since you are the guest, you get to go first. I get to go first. You get to go first. All right, I'm ready. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Portrayed by Jack Webb, Ed O'Neill, and Dan Aykroyd, Joe Friday is the lead detective on what TV and film series? Oh, this is horrible. I, I don't know pop culture because I'm an academic, so... <laughs> I have four options available. I'll have to go for the four options. Okay. Your, your four opportunities are Hill Street Blues, no. Dragnet, um, The Young and the Restless, or Hawaii Five-0. I'm going with Dragnet. And you get one point. Oh, That's right. nice. Nicely done, Sam. Thank you. You are in the lead. You are beating the douche. <laughs> That's all that matters. <laughs> now it's time for the douche. That's right. <laughs> the redemption curve. He better not get an easy question. <laughs> he might. I don't know. I mean, Adam, like. It depends can, on what he knows. I can refill that glass for you. That's all I'm saying. Oh, uh, really? He is. <laughs> Man, I really wish I had a hard, hard question here at the ready. <laughs> The douche, are you ready for your question? Let's do it. Okay. As popularized by Leonard Skinner, what is considered a Saturday night special? Ah, I've, known the, I've known the answer to both of these questions off the bat. <laughs> uh, but I need to, uh, the multiple choice, please. Okay. Your multiple, multiple choice answers that. are A, a bottle of whiskey, B, an eight ball of Coke, C, a cheap handgun, or D, a prostitute. <laughs> what is considered a Saturday night special? Maybe you should they, just, all, they all sound great. Maybe you should answer from the douche perspective and just see if that's <laughs> correct. Are you sure it's not E, all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because I went on Wikipedia to make sure. That's a party. <laughs> it is a party. Uh, I'm going to give him zero for that. <laughs> Three seconds. I'm going to go with a bowl of Coke. That is incorrect. Steve, gun. Or, it is a gun. That is correct. <laughs> 38 snub nose to be. Uh, that is correct. That makes sense. Correct. It'll wow. put you six feet in a hole. Yes. So, Steve, congratulations. <laughs> I'm pulling my phone out. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, it's not on vibrate, but like Google's coming out. That makes sense. No, that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Especially it's coming from Leonard Skinner. Yeah. Stop. We don't want to get. I know. I know. Just that much. Just that much. Okay, yeah, three <laughs> seconds. That's all. We- okay, Steve, are you ready for your question? Uh-huh. Okay. As a children of the 90s, 
Thursday was always considered must-see TV. Oh, good Lord. I actually know this because I'm so old. <laughs> what, this is what, horrible. What was the first show ever shown as part of NBC's must-see TV lineup? Oh, shit. Uh, give me the multiple choice, please. Your options are <laughs> Mad About You, Friends, Frasier, or Cheers. I'm going to go with Friends. And that is incorrect. Ooh. Sam, would you like to oh. steal? Can I steal? Yes. That'd be marvelous. But here's the problem. Once you named all of those, I realized that all of them were at <laughs> one point. Yes, they were the all. Show, yeah, right. they were. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we know that he said, what did you say? Steve? I said friends. 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 So so friends we know is... that that was later, right? Mm -hmm. Are My other three options are what? Are Mad About You, mm -hmm. Frasier, and Cheers. Oh, it's either Cheers or Mad About You. I'm going to go with... Is it? Cheers. <laughs> the douche. I love Damn it. It's it. a good one. <laughs> is it? No, it actually is not cheers. Damn, it's mad about you, wasn't it? Frazier. You can't answer. Yeah, he can. He it's, can. He's got 50-50. It's not Frazier. <laughs> and he answered wrong. Oh, it is, fantastic. in fact, mad about you. Damn it. I feel frustrated. <laughs> so frustrated. That was my first guess. This is how students feel all the time. <laughs> I should go with my first guess. Right. And the truth is, you should. Yeah. And I'm always telling them, you should. And then I didn't do it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are on to round two. Ooh. How many rounds are there in this quiz? Three. Oh, I was hoping it was two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your question is, U2's Sunday, Bloody Sunday, describes the horror felt by an observer of the troubles in Northern Ireland. On what album did the song debut? Would you like your options? No, I'm going to guess that it was war. Hot damn. Two points. Thanks, man. Ooh. Nicely done. Thank you. I'm going to go have a beer while you guys are <laughs> sure, That was fantastic. Damn. Got to walk away. <laughs> <laughs> Too hot. That's right. Bask in the glory. All right. The douche. I can't keep calling you that. Anyway. You can call me Mike if you I can. <laughs> I just feel so wrong doing that. It's all character work, Adam. I know. <laughs> you I know. preserve his character from Instagram. Right. Do this for him. That's right. Okay. The douche. Are you ready for your next question? <laughs> yes. Okay. Deliberately similar to its classic Sunday comics, the Wednesday comic series was a weekly anthology comic book created by what publisher? Publisher. Would you like your options or um, would you like to go for the two points? I'll need my options. Your options are DC, Marvel, Dark Horse, or Vertigo. I don't have a clue, but I'll guess. Go for it. Are you looking at me because I'm older? <laughs> yeah. You're like, yeah. Yeah. Did you see that? I heard that. Well, he's a douche. What do you expect? Marvel, <laughs> Vertigo, or what? Dark Horse. I'm going to guess DC. And the douche is on the board. Yeah. Mm. Dang. Nice well done. played. Did you have that, Steve? No. Oh. Okay. I actually would have said Marvel because I remember there was a Spiderman. Um, Spiderman. Like, Spiderman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There, there was like a Spider-Man serial mm -hmm. in the papers, so that's what I would have guessed. That's why I put that in there. All right. All right. Steve, are you ready for your question? Could be. Okay. In October of 2020, this restaurant chain filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, citing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. TGI Fridays? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, would you like to steal for it's a days of the week. <laughs> I'm going to go for... Oh, wait, no, they did That was a great guess. Mm. <laughs> that was a good guess. I haven't read the options yet. Right. Oh, I'll read... <laughs> Let's go for the options. Thank you. Man. Your I options are... That. And don't... I can still steal if you miss <laughs> no, no, it. That's yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Your options are TGI Fridays. Uh, that was not it. <laughs> Ruby Tuesday. Ah, oh, Thursdays. Or every day's a Sunday. I'm going to go with Ruby Tuesdays. That is correct. Oh, Fuck. I thought they were already bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. Well, so did I. <laughs> like for years. Possibly morally. <laughs> <laughs> and Sam with a commanding four to one to one lead. I really, really? gave him that one too uh, by reacting wow. to Ruby Tuesdays. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, that did help. Yeah. I really do appreciate Damn it, it Steve. <laughs> and Sam, you get to extend your lead or you have the availability to extend your lead. The pressure is on. Saturday Night Live has aired on NBC since 1975. Who hosted the first episode on October 11th, 1975? Oh, man, I think I have an idea of who it is, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. Be, I'm gonna be conservative. Okay. Would you like and to hear I, your I would options? Like my four options. Yeah. Okay. Your options are Richard Pryor, 
Bill Murray, George Carlin, or Steve Martin? Man, I really think it was Steve Martin. That's who I was going to guess. I'm going to go with Steve Martin. And that is incorrect. Damn. The douche. Thanks for guessing that, because that's what I was going to guess. Uh, see? <laughs> that's common knowledge. Your remaining <laughs> options are Richard Pryor, Bill Murray, or George Carlin. Well, I know Bill Murray was on the cast at some point, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's him. Are you going to? I shouldn't be eliminated. I shouldn't be talking like, through it. Know, right? yeah. Still <laughs> has a chance here. Shit, that's right. Forgot that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to guess Inside voice. George Carlin. And that is correct. Oh, the nice douche has way. doubled his score. And there was much rejoicing. And there was. <sighs> Am I losing? Damn. Yes, soundly, I might Damn. add. Damn. Soundly. <laughs> Damn it. It's nice of you as host to lose. <laughs> the douche, are you ready for your next question? Let's do it. Okay. Thursday Island, known for its pearl and shell trade, is located off the coast of what country? Would you like your options? I'm going to need the options. Your options are... I'll go, I'm going for the silver medal here. <laughs> <laughs> Your options are Australia, New Zealand, Japan, or the United States. <laughs> uh, New Zealand. That is incorrect. Steve, would you like to steal? I would like to steal, but I don't know if I can. Would you like to try <laughs> to steal? Uh, Australia. And Steve is on the board. I'm already on the board. I got another point. Is on the board more. <laughs> with two points. <laughs> with two points. And Always you, gay Australia. And you are tied with the douche. Yes, it is actually just off the northern coast of Australia, between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Mm. Uh, it's in that little middle finger part. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's off the tip of that. Yeah. Always gay Australia. Always go Australia. All right. Steve, are you ready for your question? Yes. The 80s one-hit wonder till Tuesday is known for what new wave staple? Ugh. Choices, please. Yes, I think I do. Your choices are, and I ran, Voices Carry, Mexican Radio, and Tainted Love. I'm ready to steal on what, this. what were B and C? B was Voices Carry, and C was Mexican Radio. Voices Carry. Well done, sir. That was very good. That was yeah. good. Yeah. Nice <laughs> done. I don't even know that genre that well. Dang. I don't either. I had, Dang. To, I had to look it up. <laughs> so that puts us in our bonus round, which is worth a bonus three round. points. Three oh, points. Now there's pressure. Okay. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and just so everybody knows, Sam is in the lead with four points. Steve is in second with three points. Duncan and, on the douche. <laughs> and Duncan on the douche with two points. <laughs> this I'm question my is worth three points. <laughs> This the douche would never say, I'm trying my hardest. <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand, you just came on the show with a bigger douche than you. <laughs> I know how to turn on the jet, sir. you got to get this character down, damn it. <laughs> We're going to have lessons after the show. That's right. Be He's given a visual douche. douche. I know. He's I'm not just, the verbal douche. He's just all about the Instagram That's fine. I just, just got to start giving him douche lessons. That's, That's all. Work He's out. got a bag of old tomatoes in the back of his car. <laughs> Steve could we'll go out a, to 19. Steve could be a douche mentor I'm to his douche. I'm his douche coach. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I never thought I would have a douche coach. <laughs> a douche I, guru. I still prefer mentor, but, you know. Is this the record for how many times douche has been said on your show? It is. It yeah. could be. And we're not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> Are we going to edit any of this douche out? Or no. Just Hell no. Mentor nope. part? No. Okay. <laughs> just maybe the mentor part. Damn it. <laughs> okay. And this one is for all the marbles because this is a three-point bonus question. My pressure. The Pittsburgh Steelers have oh. played in three of the five lowest scoring games in Monday Night Football history. Mm -hmm. In these three games, how many total points did the Steelers score? Everybody gets an opportunity to answer. Sam, I will start with you. Can you see the anguish on my face? <laughs> yes. It is palpable. Okay. Um, so there's no way I can pick that number out of nowhere. You just got to guess. I know right. one of the games specifically. Oh, man. The douche is going to come up and win. Oh, damn it. <laughs> douche. <laughs> damn, All douche. right. Give me the uh, four options. Oh, you get no options. Oh, there's no options? No. I'm nope. going to say 13. 13. All right. Sam is in with 13. Is this a closest? Whoever gets closest? Yes. Oh, yes. I might have revised my number, but I'll <laughs> go with it. I wrote, I wrote it in pen. There's no go back. <laughs> <laughs> All 
It was going to be my guess, so. The douche. What is your answer? I know they literally won a game once, three to nothing. So I'm going to go with nine. Nine points to the douche. Honestly, that seems like a better guess. I regret my 13. (laughs) (laughs) And Steve. I'm going to go weird and go 12. And go 12. Yeah. Okay. Two field goals and a touchdown with a missed kick. (laughs) Ah, okay. All right. So the question again was, the Pittsburgh Steelers have played in three of the five lowest scoring games in Monday Night Football history. In these three games, how many total points did the Steelers score? And the answer is six. Jesus. So (laughs) the dark horse, the douche comes from behind. No way. (laughs) Suck it, losers. He is no longer the douchey. Yeah, that's good. (laughs) He is the champion douche. He is the king douche. The alpha douche. Champion of the Monday's quiz. (laughs) Congratulations. That was well fought. Thank you. That was exciting. It was. I mean, you know, maybe not for the listeners, but from this perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll be excited. They'll Some, enjoy it. Sometimes you just have to do things for yourself, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's good. <laughs> the show has always been for us. It's not. <laughs> yes, right. The, it's fact, not about the, the fact that we're the number two Pittsburgh beer podcast is just circumstantial of mm-hmm. the fact that we enjoy what we're doing. Well, you know, we've always tried to just be the number two Washington County brewery. See? Because, okay. you know, it's not like we're going to beat four points. You know? <laughs> See? We yeah, and it's not like have, we're going to be drinking partners. Yeah, we gotta, know that. you got to have realistic expectations. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, yes, thank you, everybody, for uh, participating in that quiz. It took me, like, a good 45 minutes to put together, so I felt good. Oh, good work. Oh, nice. wow. Yeah. yeah. You can we, tell you put a lot of work We blew through it a lot faster than yeah. that. What? I hope <laughs> it wasn't disappointing for you. No, that was fantastic. That was well participated in. Oh, there you go. Yes. Yeah. All right, then. Do well, we want to talk beer? Yes. Well, yeah, but before that, can we just go to that? Bright shining moment when I knew the U2 album. <laughs> that, were, that was awesome. They were dunking on fans with that one. Yeah, yeah. And then the rest I saw. But that's no. all. all right. Let's go back to the beer. Yes, the uh, the rebellious rye, still good. Yeah, actually, good it's not anymore because it's. Oh gone. yeah, yeah. I'll drink it. It's oh, gone. But Can I pour you some more? Maybe it maybe. might help you. <laughs> or maybe we'll take some pours of some other things. But <laughs> well, I'm just if you need yeah. for the analysis. Right. Understood. Understood. Uh, no, I, 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 I had a good, pretty good analysis. Yeah. It was good because it's gone. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. the analysis. That's, that's oh. always the good analysis. <laughs> right. If you've gotten to this point in the show and it's gone, mm-hmm. chances are it's good. That's yeah. good. And, and that carries through on this one as well. Yeah. Don't change it. Keep the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. I, I thought it, it, yes, it had that hoppiness to kind of get on that IPA side of things, mm-hmm. but it also leaned over on the rye side as well, which I appreciate. I, I personally, since I'm a malt guy, yeah. yeah, I'm about that. I mean, I know you don't like IPAs, mm-hmm. but in general, you can sense the hoppiness here, right? Yes, okay. yes, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It is not without hop. Right, Yeah. but you still liked it. Yes. So you, you struck a very delicate balance. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would say the same, but I would say change it. More spice. <laughs> Make it more spice. Just because, I mean, we there is that comparison between this and the amber. Mm-hmm. And I think the amber works really well for the utility it serves of a maltier but hoppier beer. This one should be that next level elevation. Yeah. Uh, just being that little bit spicier, a little bit kickier. You know, something something more for me. Adam can still stick with the tangled aggression and be happy. (laughs) Well, I've toyed with the idea. So this is for anyone who's interested in brewing. Mm -hmm. There's a nice, very smooth bittering hop I like called Apollo. Mm -hmm. And I've been bought, I've been bittering this with nugget as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, what if I threw some Apollo in there? It'd give you more of that bitterness on the tip of your tongue. Yeah. But then what you're looking for, and it might not alienate you. So now that's the I next like iteration. Yes. We'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Yes. I also would like to say that the feedback you guys have given me, like this is what you always wish Untapped was. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've yes. managed to now. Everyone, Two stars, I don't like Rye. <laughs> exactly, yeah, right. <laughs> but like this kind of feedback is really useful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all of my brewer friends are always like, you got to not look at Untapped. And of course, for the first three months, I was like always checking Untapped. Yep. And then like yep. I realized that my life was just easier if I didn't. <laughs> right. But like this is really valuable feedback. So like if people are posting on Untapped, please know that on the rare occasion that a brewer looks at this stuff, like 
the it's the comments that really yeah. are helpful. Yeah. yeah, like we know the ratings are going to be wherever. Like, it's a one to five scale. It's yeah. awkward to begin with, but like the comments are always helpful. Yeah, yeah. The more and I mean our former our former co-host Sam. He when he posts on Untapped, he'll paste a paragraph. Yeah, he'll, yeah, put, he'll, so he'll, he'll, he'll give he'll yeah. give a lot of good feedback. But you know, yeah, those people that are just like two, not for me. That, that's, right. that's shitty, lazy, and people can't do anything with that. You exactly, can't, they can't be actionable right. with it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and I'm sure like it's not just us, but like, like I I don't know if you've done like a beer fest yet or not. But we, we haven't yet. Yeah. Like, we've really had just one event. We had our first event on Sunday. The douche helped me with it, yeah. actually. It was really good. How un douche like really good. <laughs> <laughs> How un-douche-like. Well, he was a douche to the customers. Ah, good enough. Yeah, that's good. Um, and um, and he, you were douche. Like, he went off and, like, hung out with his parents because it was Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Whatever. Uh, what, a, what a douche. <laughs> I know. Not that there was no one to serve, so it was fine. But, like, you know, I mean, we haven't done one yet, but I'm really looking forward mm-hmm. to it. So we've signed up for a couple of things. We could, there's a, something in Washington County in July. Okay. There's something over in South Point in August. There's beers in the Berg in um, September. Of course. But I, yeah, I think you'll find when you do the beer fest, you'll you'll find a lot more of the same kind of engagement yeah. of people wanting to actually talk about the beer mm-hmm. and like offer their thoughts about it. Something you may or may not get in the tap house, mm-hmm. but you know, you definitely don't get on untaps. Right. <laughs> For sure. I mean, we do, I think, get it with the tap room, especially with our regulars. Like mm-hmm. a lot of times, like I'll bring them out samples, even, you know, just from the sample port on the tank. Mm-hmm. It's not even, sometimes I'll bring it out. It's not even carbonated yet. And like, <laughs> you get to see their faces like, <laughs> this is like, this is not carbonated, <laughs> right? But one thing you do yeah (laughs) as a brewer though you're always tasting the beer Mm -hmm. right and you're tasting it as it goes through so that you know when it's done and all that kind of stuff but like um that's a really important part of the process and i love incorporating the tap room into that process so that's one thing that i think is pretty cool about mondays if you come here and especially if you come here regularly you're probably going to become part of the process of (laughs) that's awesome hey that's great thing Mm -hmm. but uh part of our process is we run the podium in we which do. we rank all the beers that we drank on this episode, bronze, silver, and gold. And Sam, of course, you're going to go last because these are your babies. Sounds fair. But we'll start with Adam. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll start with me. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> because Adam seemed conflicted. Yeah, that was I'm very non douchey of you. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't have douche in my name. That's I just true. have douche tendencies. I gotcha. I gotcha. <laughs> I have the I have the capability, <laughs> but I don't always use the power. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for me, um, I'll go bronze with the uh, the the tangled aggression. I I like it a lot, and it has it definitely has a utility of you know pairs really well with meat. I think it would pair really well like the gamier the better, mm. just because that beer is strong with the flavors it comes with. It comes with a nice malt, and it comes with you know, a strong hot profile. And so you could put pretty much any, uh, like strong meat, barbecue, game, venison, yeah, sure. steak, you can put that up against it and it'll pair just fine. It's an aggressive beer. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's still kind of an amber and it's still, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's still just, I mean, it's nothing on you. It's, it's a great amber. I, I, I you know, but it, it's still just an amber for me. <laughs> I got you. It's yeah, fair. Yeah. Uh, silver, I'm going to put the Rebellious Rye. Uh, I enjoy this. I, I enjoy it as an IPA. It has that very interesting profile provided by the, the rye in the, in the grist. And it comes out a little dry, and it's a nice drinker. Uh, again, pretty much every beer that we drank tonight is a real dusk beer or a fall beer. Anything, mm-hmm. you know, cookout beer, they all have that same use that w- they would be great for. And they're all pretty drinkable. And they're all drink a lot of bowl. Yes. Yeah. Because they're not good. they're not high ABV. But uh, yeah, the, the rebellious rye, the only the only thing I would say is I just I just wish it was a little bit spicier on mm-hmm. the hop, but you know, other people would disagree with me. But yeah, I still think it's incredibly drinkable and I I like the fact that it's kind of an older style that's brought back. I uh, love it. With that, that goes to gold though, because the Kentucky Common is so clean drinking and i feel like that's the most perfectly balanced beer Mm -hmm. and especially because of the style that it's going after it's a great representation of that style 
Like it's completely clean. That cluster hop doesn't intrude at all, but I'm sure it's doing some work in there that's unnoticeable <laughs> to my shit palate. <laughs> <laughs> that's the beauty of that hop. Yeah. I mean, I honestly believe it. Like it gets out of the way. Mm-hmm. It does its job and then it's like, it's out of there. Yeah. Love it. But it, yeah, it's a, it's that, that is the most crushable beer that we had tonight and you can easily just put a shitload of those down and uh, I sure. would not be against it. <laughs> so, I guess yeah. it's my turn, isn't it? Yes. <sighs> All right. I think I do have to agree with Steve on the bronze with the tangled aggression. And that's not to say that any of them are bad. Um, but I, I felt that of the three... I honestly didn't think that until you qualified <laughs> it that way. He, he's always going... He always it's qualifies fine until it that like way. now. I know. I've heard this in like multiple podcasts. It's like... Not to say that any of your beers are bad, yeah. but this is what I think. <laughs> but now I'm just going to rip the Band-Aid. Yeah, right <laughs> but uh, it, it, it is a well-crafted beer, uh, and it is a good beer to be able to pull the malt heads over to the hop side and the hop heads over to the malt side. I like that. Uh, but for me, I see an amber. My mind immediately goes to all, all malt, not a whole lot of hop. Mm-hmm. So it. And that comes down to, I won't even say marketing. That's more of my mindset. It, and it was kind of jostled my mindset a little bit. But there is value in that. For sure. Uh, but for me and my palate, that kind of puts that in the bronze medal position. In the silver medal position, this is where things get a skosh more difficult. But I think I, I'm looking at your whiteboard because I'm kind of <laughs> looking back and forth and I'm trying to make a decision. Okay, I got it. Silver medal, I'm actually going to put the pre-prohibition. Ooh, the, the Kentucky, Kentucky Common. The Kentucky wow. Common is yeah. going in the silver medal position. Uh, it is a very well-crafted beer. And it, Steve called it a dusk beer. All of these as dusk beers. Mm-hmm. I would put these more as flannel beers. Oh, yeah, I get that. Yeah, that's 90s. I mean, like, yeah. I grew up in the 90s. <laughs> Flannels. Right. <They're, laughs> both North grunge West. and yeah, cold. Grunge. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I'm good with this. You, yeah. got that, you, know, you got that Seattle cold. It's perfect for the grunge and, you know, the first beer around the campfire before you really start getting chilled out. This is the, all three of these beers are good for that. Uh, but I, I got to put that rebellious rye on gold simply because yeah. I liked it. Yeah. It's, it, it's an IPA that I liked. So that automatically puts it in the gold medal position because <laughs> I don't like IPAs. <laughs> That's what I was is, thinking. Yeah. Is this the first episode that you've ranked an IPA higher than I've ranked an IPA? Possibly yes. This is yes. <laughs> Possibly yes. <laughs> Sam Sam has found a formula. <laughs> yes. Those are I love ones. it. I no longer feel bad for losing the quiz. <laughs> no, you're all right. You're in good shape. But yeah, the simple fact that it's a, a an IPA that I liked, I don't have to say anything else about it. Good beer, period. Come get it. Drink it. And then when it's gone, <laughs> drink the other ones. But drink this one first. <laughs> that's it. That's all. I, that, that's my that's ranking. Good. I love it. Yeah. On to the douche. I do want to hear what the douche has to Me say. Me too. I am genuinely curious. I will preface this by saying they are all excellent beers. Mm-hmm. Please come out to Mondays. Tip the shit out of your bartenders because they're great. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm going to go bronze. I'm going to go with the rebellious rye. Mm. And I'm not going to have long explanations just because. Silver, I'm going to go with the Tangled Aggression because it's kind of been said before. It's a great in-between beer. Mm-hmm. If you like hops, you'll like it. If you like more malty styles, you'll like that. The gold is the Pre-Prohibition Kentucky Common mm-hmm. because it's an incredibly incredible drinkable beer. And I want Sam to make it again. So, <laughs> hint, I, hint. I hear that. <laughs> I don't think we have too much left, so... Yeah, he's we're, down, to, he's we're on to, the last keg. He's going to have to brew it again. Yeah. So please do that. Agreed. Agreed. Will do. So Sam, it is your time. It is time for you to rank your babies. That's really fun in a way. First, I want to start off by saying how much I really have appreciated the feedback you guys have given me. Like brewers really do want to hear intelligent feedback on what they're doing because we put so much time into it. It's the first and, time we've been called intelligent feedback. Well, but. okay. <laughs> well, seriously. Seriously. Yeah. I, was, I was actually calling the feedback intelligent, but like still, it's okay. But um, like we really do, I think, you know, take that very seriously because certainly from my perspective, I do this because... The biggest rush I get is when somebody comes up, like at that 
farm thing that we did. Mm -hmm. And they were like, that's the best beer I ever had. And I was like, holy yeah. fuck. That's fantastic. <laughs> right. I mean, you might have to strike that. Sorry. Oh, no, but I was kind of like, you're allowed I to say fuck. Did not, <laughs> I did not ever think that like it would be the best beer you had. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it'd be a good beer, but like that was awesome. So um, for me, this is hard because like all of these are, you know, like children of a sword. I'm going to put in bronze the Kentucky Common. Ooh. Not because it's not an exquisite beer and not because I don't drink it the most. I actually drink it the most. <laughs> but I have a palate that is really into strong flavors, mm -hmm. right? And that Kentucky Common is the beer I will drink the most because I need a 5% beer that I can drink several of, not a 6.8% beer, <laughs> right? Um, but it's a really, really flavorful beer that I really enjoy. Now, for silver... I'm going to go with the rye. Oh, okay. I, I love the rye. I think from for flavor, I'd probably put it gold. But I'm going to put it silver because I am just deeply attached to the Tangled Aggression, right? Which is my effort to kind of perfect this beer that's not perfect yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to keep playing with it. And the thing that's really interesting about that, and the reason I'm going to give it the gold, is that it's still, you know, really... It creates this great passion for me to make the perfect beer that I haven't quite made yet. Mm -hmm. So none of that has anything to do with flavor, right, or <laughs> drinkability or anything like that. It's just of all about the making of it. It's the pursuit of perfection. It truly is because that beer is really close to perfect, but it requires a grain that I can't source. So I'm trying to find other <laughs> grains. To, so it's like this perpetual, like, tweaking of grains like mm -hmm. to get it spot on where it should be so i think i'm going to give tangled aggression the gold okay um from my perspective right mm -hmm. rebellious rye the silver and the kentucky common but what i would say is if i thought of it not as myself but instead of the customer mm -hmm. i'd probably throw the rye on top mm -hmm. then the kentucky common then the tangled aggression okay <laughs> right on fair enough yeah all right. Well, why don't you just continue right along, Sam, and give us all your social media plugs, any events you have coming up. Just let us know what's going on at Mondays, how people can find you. Okay, for sure. There's a couple of things I'd want to say. First, please remember that we're open on Mondays because we're called Mondays. <laughs> Part of the reason for that is because I was always pissed that I couldn't get a craft beer on Monday. So this is the place you can come to get one on Monday and come on down because Mondays have turned into a pretty big day for us. There's also an industry discount. If you're in a bar or a restaurant and you work, Monday's your weekend. Come on out. We'll give you a discount. I guess the thing I would say is we have some events coming up that we will always publicize on our social media. So we're at Monday's Brewing on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's the easiest way. We're also, we have a website. It's mondays.beer. And it's always got our up-to-date menu on it. If you're concerned about our hours or anything like that, there is this thing called Google. Just look us up. <laughs> It'll tell you exactly when we're open, exactly how to get here. It's always funny to watch the people who cruise by the plaza, <laughs> and they're like, what's going on? There's people in there on a Wednesday, but it, <laughs> the sign says closed. And then every once in a while, people come in and they're like, why don't you have a big neon sign that says open? And it's because we don't have neon. <laughs> you know, so, you know, everything's available online. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing that's really funny is that we also used to get a lot of questions of like, why don't you have a phone? Because we don't use it. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, and have you been to like some other places where the phone's ringing off the hook at the bar? We want to give the people that are here our attention, right? Mm -hmm. So communicate with us electronically. We will get back with you easily, usually within 10 minutes. Like one of us is always online. DMs with, are open. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And so, you know, you, your best bet is to connect with us electronically. Right on. Yeah. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll slide over to both the best and worst douche I've ever met. Mike, <laughs> where can people find you on, on the social media? Uh, they can find me on Instagram at PGHBeerDouche. That's it, really. I mean, I do have other <laughs> social media, but that's all I'm going to plug right here. That's I like the character. Um, follow the character. Yeah, <laughs> follow right. the character. Uh, you know, working on an OnlyFans. It's not still working some kinks <laughs> out there. But, yeah, uh, kinks on OnlyFans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, right. that's how you make exactly. the money. <laughs> exactly. 
Right on. So, That's yeah, it. follow him. Check him out. He's got a lot of good content there. Sure. And if you want to find us on social media, all you have to do is search Hop Nation USA, and that'll get you Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you want to listen to brand new episodes of the Hop Nation USA podcast every Friday, as you should, then search Hop Nation USA on your favorite podcatcher, like Stitcher Podbean, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Player FM, uh, anything that starts in pod and ends in cast, we're on those platforms. Come but find it, us. Yes. But if you're on any of those platforms, leave a five-star review because... We are a six-days-a-week show, but they only let us use five. And that's a bigger crime than a certain <laughs> beer that has even more days a week. I don't like that beer. It's a bad blonde ale. I'm sorry. That's okay. I, but Ooh. S'mores Nitro I is back. I know. I know. I didn't hear that. No, you guys didn't say that. It's all me, and I'll take it. I don't care. But also, S'mores Nitro is back, so yes. Oh. <laughs> is that part of the Blackwater series? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's all, the, that's all the plug that they get. Yeah. Hey, I didn't say them by name. I don't that's care. Right. Come to Mondays instead. Exactly. Come to Mondays. And uh, we want to thank Sam for having us down here again. Obviously, we always enjoy anytime somebody invites us into their space and is willing to tell us their story and share their beer. And their passion. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you again for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. We'll be back next week with something else. Yeah, we don't know. We didn't plan ahead yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you'll find out next week on Friday, as you should. But until then, enjoy the Hop Nation USA podcast. Bye. Bye.